Is this calls? Because <laughs> I think his WhatsApp's on that. You know when you set your WhatsApp and like nobody can tell if you read the thing or not? I hate that, man. I'm a blue check mark kind of guy. It's like it is what it is. If I'm ignoring you, I want you to know it. Um, <laughs> yeah, so I don't know. Just check. Maybe you should. Hey, Chris trying to get a hold of you again. Um, so there's that. He's got his bill, which is the... Um, it's rolled back to BPT, but then there's a sales tax. Was it like 2% or something? Yeah, that's I think correct. it's a rollback of two and then add on to um, sales tax, right? Didn't he also have that like online tax or something that he was trying to do last year? Yeah, I think I believe so that he was trying to do something with the, uh, you know, when you order off island and it comes in uh, taxing through Amazon or things like that. Yeah, they they were going to do that as part of that that bill. As a matter of fact, we were in committee of the whole uh, when we were discussing the uh, governor's uh, uh, bill for refunding uh, ser uh, series bonds, uh, and that bill passed. And so uh, they were discussing the fact that uh, they were looking forward to additional income uh, by implementing that uh, online tax. Wow. Um. Then so there's that one, and then there's another one. Whose bill is the rollback to BPT, but then it's tied to the unemployment insurance? I, I think that was uh, Mary's, right? Yeah, Senator Torres. Oh, I see Mary. I think Torres. Mary yeah, Senator Torres. Marin Torres. Yeah. And then there's uh, Talina, I believe, is Senator uh, Nelson is on that, as well as Senator Shelton. And I think uh, as well as uh, uh, Vice Speaker Tina Munya Barnes. So there's four. So it's all four, Democrats. Uh, Mm -hmm. um and then you guys got the <laughs> bpt like you guys is just is it no frills it's just straight up let's roll this sucker back and that's it that's what it is. straight up roll it back five to four right on <laughs> and so i guess we'll just... well, you know chris that go was ahead, a, ahead, that was the intention in the beginning when yeah. when the bill first passed during the cowboy administration right was that they had a sunset provision to take it right back down to 4%. So, you know, um, in light of everything that's going on, that's what we're looking at is taking it right back to 4% where it was previously. Yeah, and that's why Senator Ada and I were talking about that last night um, when we saw the news report um, as far as the questions that uh, Senator San Augustine is asking uh, the federal government. And, and, and the thing is, is that, that, first of all, once again, it was supposed to sunset after six months. And, and the deal is, uh, we don't believe that this is supplanting any funding. Like, it's not changing our tax scheme saying that because of this funding in particular, you know, we're reducing. Also, if you look at the situation with um, the uh, uh, earned income tax credit, that is now a federal recognition of the fact that that should have been being paid uh, out of the federal uh, coffers, much like they administer the program stateside. So this actually is... Uh, you know, uh, additional revenue, not a tax adjustment per se. So uh, that was when I listened to the chamber the other day, you know, to me, the fundamental reasoning uh, that they were using to roll back the BPT was um, more in line with the EITC than anything else uh, because of that uh, uh, close to $60 million windfall that the government will be experiencing. Yeah. And then in, in addition to that, when you look at what the Biden administration is looking at doing is, uh, rolling back the the tax reduction on corporation tax from 21 back up to 28 percent. So, you know, all these all these things uh, in conjunction with one another, you know, we really need to take a look at and say, okay, let's roll back now our BPT back to four percent. Let's give these businesses a, a helping hand up, right, so that we can get our people back uh, back employed, and you know, get the certain the dollars circulating within our economy. Uh, when you hear the, about the tourism that, you know, they don't expect tourism to get back to full per, uh, to 100 percent for several couple of years from now, several years, two, three years from now, the we need to start generating revenue within our economy, within ourselves. So we need to keep the dollars on island by opening up the stores and, you know, and which has been progressively opening. Restaurants have been progressively going up in uh, in, in indoor dining from uh 25 to 50 percent. Now they're allowing eight people. And, you know, hats off to the governor for, for recognizing that and um, keep moving in that adjustment up. So hopefully we'll be able to be at 100 uh, percent within our local community first uh, shortly. I, and that I way agree. we can continue to generate the revenues. I, I agree with Senator Ada. And, and you know, I, I hope we're not just going from 
you know, emergency declaration to emergency declaration waiting to do these adjustments. Because it seems to me that the numbers are, are so steady in terms of their decline and where it's been that I think we have to give a recognition to these businesses that they've figured it out. You know, they understand how to operate and, and that uh, I, I think we should go to 100% uh, uh, quite quickly. And I think that the businesses need it. A lot of them with these margins right now at 50%, you know, they're, they're just keeping the doors open, but they're not able to bring on any new employees. They're not able to give their employees raises. And, and that's what this BBT is really all about. You know, we have to really kind of continue to sit down with economists and, 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 and others and discuss these issues. Maybe do a quarterly uh, meeting of the special economic service because there, you know, here we are uh, a few months ago or just last month, actually, when uh, uh, Lester Carlson came in and told us the good news that we didn't have to do government realignment because, you know, uh, yeah, revenue to the government is starting to, to come back as we started to, to open now. So, I mean, Chris and Bree, it just stands to reason if you give these businesses the relief that they need, roll back this BPT. You know, it might not be an immediate change in prices and the like, but it means they're going to invest in their businesses. It means they're going to bring on more employees. It means that, you know, they're, they're, they can possibly give raises to employees that they haven't been able to reward for their hard work and staying with them through the hard times. That money goes back into the economy. We are going to see that money, uh, you know, through taxation uh, in terms of when they buy goods and services. So, so really, um, you know, I think we got to really continue to understand how the economy works, what it means to not take too much money out of the private sector, especially in Guam where we're a closed economy and we're service-based in you know, uh, the majority of, of what we do. It's, it's a very complex model. You know, We don't bring money in from many other jurisdictions except the federal government, really. And, and, and so the bottom line is, is we've got to be cognizant of the fact that keep that money rolling in the economy and, 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 and don't overtax our businesses. Uh, so with all that going on, why do you think it's still such a hard no from the governor on, on rolling back this BBT? I mean, everybody says it. We had Christine Belletto on uh, Monday. She was like, yep, still hard no. Yeah, I think, you know, her concern is that with the um, with the uh, corporation tax uh, cut still in place and, you know, the levels of... Um, uh, tax uh, taxes re uh, being generated and coming into the government, and you know she ha she has a concern there, but I think with all the programs that are becoming available now with the the reimbursement of the EITC, most especially you know because that's about sixty million dollars in itself, and then you know if when the Biden administration moves forward with their their plan to uh, increase corporation tax again then uh, the governor needs to look at and see where can we readjust to ensure that we're being, you know, we're being, um, how do you say, um, considerate of our local community and our, and our local businesses to say, well, okay, we can, we can roll back the BPT now at this point and ensure that uh, we get uh, revenues generated. Uh, you know, Chris, as a, as a small business owner myself, man, you know, we need a, we need to keep the lights on. We need to keep the, the, the power on, you know, and the employees uh, uh, paid. And this this rollback of the BPT will ensure that, you know, we're we're able to give back again to our to our employees. I mean, you know, we haven't increased prices for years, and even during this pandemic, we kept a steady a steady flow of uh, of uh, we kept we kept our prices stable. So, you know, in that, we like to see what the government can do now to ensure that they can give back now to the business community. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, the governor yeah, can, you... um, she can hate on uh, the, the bill um, all she wants, but uh, do you guys have the votes for one, to be for it to be passed? And then number two, uh, when it's vetoed, do you have enough for an override? Well, well, you know, Chris and Bree, that's why I was texting you the other day while I was watching the hearing. Um, if you look at the just the two bills, the the one for the unemployment uh, insurance, and then uh, of course um, our Republican caucus has been um, very strong in supporting this rollback. And so, if you combined those votes, um, it's ten votes, ten strong votes. And so, uh, I, I I think that the intent of the legislature just by virtue of those two bills, 
has already been expressed. I think the issue with regard to uh, Joe St. Augustine's bill, with regard to the 3% and the 2% sales tax, that's just going to take so much maneuvering. It's going to take meetings, uh, you know, uh, but from all sectors of the community, revenue tax, how to implement this, how to do it. I just don't think that that's feasible at this point to just get out of the gate with that. But when you look at the other two that are combined, it's clear. I mean, there are 10 votes there. Now it's just about the philosophy of, of what's going to happen. And, you know, the governor made a very strong push during her speech that she has got a solution for the unemployment insurance. She is going to, you know, work with the federal government to get grants to whatever other maneuvers uh, that she has has come up with with her team to make such a strong pronouncement uh, during her address. You know, it was it was it was one of the highlights. Um, you know, of, 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 of that speech, actually. Um, and, and so I think that people are excited about her plan, but it never once uh, contemplated uh, using the money uh, from the BPT reduction, and it never once contemplated general fund revenues. And, and we all know that unemployment insurance, if it's going to be modeled after the way it's take, done stateside, uh, it's going to require a, also participation by the businesses uh, for a set aside to make sure that this money is there. So it's a very complex um, uh, issue. And and I, so I don't think that, uh, you know, uh, uh, I think that if those senators could see that, uh, you know, the governor says, you know, uh, we got this Guam uh, unemployment insurance, I'm going to do it. Well, then if you're already for the BPT rollback, let's just do it. Yeah, you guys are talking about in her speech, she had said uh, something about it was compact impact funds, right? Yeah, it was kind of some kind of a combination of, 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 of that and, and, and some federal and also some federal grants. Um, if you know, if we go back to the text of, of, of what was said, but as I remember it, it, it was related to uh, reimbursements that we currently are getting as well as some additional grants. Right. Uh, we haven't heard anything about that. You know, another thing, Chris and Bria, when we talk about the concerns of the governor, which which are founded, but the fact of the matter is, uh, when this when this issue first hit with the Trump tax cuts, uh, and Governor Calvo, you know, made it clear we need to bridge this gap, get over it, at least have this five uh, percent for for six months, and then sunset it, and figure out uh, reorganizing our government and making sure that we control expenditures, right? Well. If you look at the current fiscal year budget, you know, I got to give kudos to the 35th. I mean, they cut the budget by over $60 million. The, but the, the government's still operating. There's no layoffs. There's no furloughs. The governor uh, has announced that uh, she, this last round of tax refunds included a uh, year 2020. Um, so it looks like uh, all hands on deck. Fiscal management is good. So there's no reason then why we can't continue you know, to, to bring efficiencies within our government and to make sure that we live within our means, the budget ceilings that we set. And then once again, if you also look at when the Trump tax cuts hit and, and, and the six months was over and it smoothed out, before COVID came, it was a banner year in 2019. Revenues were going up. I mean, and that's what, I'm sure that's because of what I was talking about earlier. The economic activity was starting to kick in from when the Trump tax cuts brought the corporate rate down to 21, the money was circulating. So it wasn't just, you know, the fact that we had high tourism numbers and the like, it was also the fact that that money was starting to do what it's supposed to do. Uh, same thing happened in the United States. I mean, the economy was on fire when those tax cuts fi uh, finally made their way to the people and, and, and that translated into tax revenue. Uh, of course, COVID was the one that knocked that out. So if we use the same model and we roll this back, there's no reason, maybe a lag time of four or five months, but the economy should spin up and we should see more GRT because that money is circulating the economy, not sitting in government coffee. You know, there was a, um, a lot of uh, noise made about when the governor had said the BPT forever. <laughs> but let me flip it on you guys. Like if we get the BPT down, down to what the 4%, is this something that you guys are going to want to keep down forever? I think so. I mean, uh, Tony, what do you think, Senator? Yeah, I, I think as well that, you know, as long as we're able to generate the revenues that we need for to keep the, the government services that uh, the, the services that the government need, needs to provide, you know, there's no reason. We, we've been at 4% for the longest time. Uh, we saw we saw what it did. We were able to generate the revenues that uh, that was required. 
uh, when we when the BPT went up to five percent, it was only because of that that the Trump tax cuts that affected govern government revenues. So now you know, government is not in the business to make a profit. Government is in the business to provide services. So with that, you know, we just need to ensure that we continue to operate the government uh, as um, as effectively and efficiently as uh, efficiently as possible, and not make a, a profit off of the uh, the private sector. You know, Chris and Bree, this brings me back to uh, when Frank Capillo, uh, I always use his example, when he came down to the legislature and there's always this back and forth on the insurance plan and the benefits for government employees and 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 the like, you know, uh, uh, which is a gen- generous plan. And, and I remember every time we go back and forth on choice or one vendor or how much, you know, we're going to save or how much do we need to add, you know, based on how we fashion the legislation and that package, you know, Frank, simply says straightforward hey you know give us give me a budget and i'll give you a plan and so that's what the legislature needs to do it has to figure out consistently what can we afford how how much tax revenue do we have and fashion our government after that there's also performance based budgeting which for some reason always gets talked about but never gets done and that brings efficiencies to the agencies as well. You know, uh, how much of their operation can they start, you know, to look at to the private sector too? How much of these operations, you know, ca- can be streamlined and, and how and, and how much of these these positions also, you know, uh, you continue to build up your employees and train them and they're, and they're good at what they do, they're efficient, you know, maybe you don't need as, as, as many bodies. So the bottom line is, is that, you know, this is, this is difficult talk, but the thing is, is it's the taxpayer's money. The taxpayers, this is not government revenue, it's tax revenue from the people, and we need to be responsible about it. And I think 4% is adequate to run this government if we collect it properly, if we appropriate properly, and if we have solid economic development. Uh, Let's talk about that Bill 73 real quick. Oh, sure. Yeah. What do you want to... Uh, so this is the bill that would, uh, repeal the section of Guam law that prohibits, the um, is it the purchase ownership of silencers and suppressors on Island? Right. So that's what it does. It just strikes out that section of public law that, uh, says that, uh, you know, you, we, you can't have silencers or, or mufflers. Right. But with that, Chris, what, there is also you know, it's just not you're going to go out and buy a suppressor or a silencer. You still have to meet the the um, the uh, Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms uh, uh, process to to be uh, qualified to to purchase one. So you know, there's still checks and balances in place. That doesn't mean that you're just going to go out there and purchase one. Uh, should this law be repealed? What uh, this changed? Bill come from? Oh. Yeah. Yeah. What? So what? What? What <laughs> made you guys say, "Hey, the, no, we people need to have suppressors and and silencers." Uh, and when was this law that you're trying to repeal enacted? How is it? In your opinion, was it? Did it just become outdated? Yeah. So you know, 42 states in the United States already allow suppressors. Uh, you know that are that are legally purchased by by individuals. So you know, this was brought up to me and. I said, you know what? Let me take a look at it. And uh, being being prior service in the military too, you know, I I saw that, you know, there is a, there is an actual need for for um, uh, silencers that where you can, you know, you go out to the range and you practice to to fire your weapon. You know, you put on your hearing protection, you put on your 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 earplugs, and you have a silencer on your weapon. You know, it, it's even better. You know. You only have one set of ears, right? And once you lose your hearing, uh, that, that's it. I mean, tinnitus is really bad now. Can you imagine if you just constantly going into the range, constantly going to range and, you know, firing your weapon? So, you know, it's, it's just one of those things. And updating the law, there's absolutely nothing wrong about updating the law. That's what we look at to do. We either repeal sections of the law or we introduce new legislation. So, and that's what I did on this bill here. So how old is this, yeah. this law? <clears throat> I think this, uh, let me see, uh, this goes back, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure when, when it was enacted into law, I, I got to look back into what, it. What was the but, in, you know, intent of it, the original law, though, Senator? Well, the, how the the silencers and mufflers came into it was on the uh, in, original intent of, of 
the public law hold up here on section 61102 uh chapter 10 so you know let me get that for you here Hey, we're, uh, by the way, KUAM TV, thank you guys so much for jamming with us. Standby centers, let me just sign off on our TV side. Sure. Uh, we're KUAM FM, I got any Guam on the breeze. That's just one part of the link uh, multimedia broadcast extravaganza. You can jump on our Facebook live feed. So to our viewers on KUAM TV, my name is Chris. I'm Sabrina. Esta. Adios. Viva Mestamoru. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, so again, Senator, I'd, I'd ask, what was the intent of the original law? Because somebody back then must have thought it was a good idea to not allow people to be able to own silencers and suppressors. Oh. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm looking for this section. You caught me off guard on this one here. We were talking about BPT going right into <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. the silencer. I, sorry. So I wasn't ready for this one here. But uh, let me just... Uh, Yeah, well, well, Senator, I had to look that up because um, I, I was, uh, had a couple of couple phone calls as well from folks asking me, you know, what, what, what is the intent here? And as Senator Ada talked about, it really is about those who use and 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 have to do a lot of range work and and use, um, you know, uh, weapons as part of their job and part of their training. And and so the one of the questions was, uh, I'm sure the intent of the law was was designed, uh, you know, to prevent. Uh, the criminal element, right? And uh, so uh, if you look at all this talk on, on, on gun control and talk about, about protecting yourself and, 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 and operating a weapon properly, uh, there's very few, if any, crimes that are committed that are using lawful firearms. Uh, you know, typically an individual who's going to go out and kill somebody, who's going to rob somebody, who's going to use a weapon for a nefarious reason, is going to do it uh, uh, with a, a, an illegally obtained, uh, stolen, or, or or some kind of a weapon that doesn't trace to them, and so and so that uh, you know that that's the idea is that if this is a discussion about you know the the possibility of criminal element and the issue of of the suppression capability, uh, I, I just don't think that uh, uh, criminals uh, care uh, what they use when they use uh, uh, weapons to do their deeds. Did you find that in 10 yet, Senator? But yeah, maybe, so it goes back okay. to the 17, uh, the 16th, 17th Guam legislature. So that's by what, uh, 19? Forgotten. Back in the 70s, right? About back in the 70s. So, you know, times has changed from the 70s to today. And, you know, updating, uh, like I said, repealing or amending laws as we move forward. Uh, you know, we just got to keep uh, uh, doing what we need to do to ensure that People stay safe. People are, uh, you know, uh, kept abreast of what's going on. So mm -hmm. that's why when we in, when I introduced this legislation, when it was brought to my attention that, yeah, you know, we need to do what we can to ensure that people are safe at the firing range. And, you know, when you fire a weapon, uh, the, the noise that comes out of it, a, a suppressor doesn't bring it down that much. So... You know, it's not like yeah, uh, yeah. you're that, watching that's what James I saw Bond in the, where, the bill, Senator, where there was a whole section about, oh, people are confusing it with the movies and what happens in the movies. And then yeah. there's a few pieces of language in your bill that say, oh, well, silencers and suppressors don't even reduce the noise that much. So <laughs> I would just offer, well, what's the point then? Well, you know, you still got to do what you can to protect your hearing. It's just like when you just wear earplugs, right? Just earplugs alone doesn't help you. You wear earmuffs over it. Uh, so, you know, layers of protection. It's just like when you're out in cold weather, right? When you, you, you layer up, it's, it's the same process, just different, uh, different scenarios. So, you know, you're protecting your hearing in this fashion and that's what we need to do. Um, there's absolutely, you, you know, it's not like a suppressor can fit one suppressor fits any, any weapon, uh, um, universally. It doesn't, you know, it, a certain suppressor goes to a certain weapon and that's the, that's how it works. So, I mean, is there is this like a is there a considerable amount of like firearms owners who are pushing for this uh, change, or is it is there like a business that's selling this stuff that we're trying to help out? 
Well, they can't. They can't there's no sell. business that's selling it currently because yeah. it's uh, it's still illegal. So, right. you know, it's uh, it's a concern that was brought up to me, and I I went forward with it. So, but I mean, there would be what, there would be. I mean, if your bill passed, right? I mean, because I don't know, I don't own any guns. I don't know about silencers, but I'm just. I mean, on its face, I was just like, wow, we just had these mass shootings, uh, which I know was addressed in your bill. You said, like Senator Duane said, nobody's doing mass shooting with silencers. Mm -hmm. I just wasn't sure of what the push was. Yeah, Yeah, you know, silencers are just, uh, it's just an, an, uh, what do you call it? Uh, It's like an apparatus to a weapon, right? It's just an an attachment to a weapon, just like a scope or, you know, uh, those are just attachments. You know, you still need the weapon itself, and then you still need the the person to fire the weapon, and you still need the bullet that goes into the weapon. So, I mean, if we're going to not, uh, uh, what they call it, uh, look at one aspect of, of a weapon as to why why do we have these laws in place, right? And, you know, it's, it just doesn't, we need to do what we can just to keep up with uh with uh, with the laws of, of Guam and you know start repealing laws where we don't deem that they're they're necessary or that we deem that they infringe infringe on on our um, on our public and move forward with it. Do you think that this is going to turn like partisan? Because like the whole gun control debate um, in the states, right? It's like pretty pretty partisan. I, I think you know, Chris. Yeah. What I learned, right, is. Okay. What I learned is that even bills that you don't think are going to be partisan, and I'll, and I'll give you a perfect example, Bill 8, right? You know, uh, you you would think that every all 15 senators would have voted yes on Bill 8, and they didn't, and that was to my surprise. So, I mean, how bills turn out in our legislature will be surprising, you know? Uh, how, how people vote, uh, how, in the, how it, it moves forward in, in the committees and things like that. So, you know... When we look at how we introduce legislation and how we we address it on the floor, it still doesn't matter because what matters is the vote at the end of, of our session. And I was expecting 15 votes on Bill 8, and I only received nine. So, you know, I I, I was shocked by it, but, you know, that was just the way it, it turned out. And, you know, who knows? Bill 73 may get 15 votes, and, you know, all 15 senators may approve. Okay. I was going to mention earlier that you know it's we still got the public hearing process, yeah. and, and and that and that's where I think really you know those constituents have come to us and said that this is something that 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 is needed. You've got adequate law, and this you know this helps us going forward. And then the opponents you know can come forward and we'll deliberate uh, the bill on its merits on that basis. That's the beauty of the in the public hearing process. We'll hear all voices and then we'll decide. Uh, going forward, but this is not something that we're we're pushing for next session agenda <laughs> or anything like that, or or, or trying to get a waiver uh, from the speaker. <laughs> so, so, for anybody who's listening and wants to uh, participate and provide testimony, the public hearing on Bill seventy three related to suppressors and silencers is scheduled for Monday, I believe, uh, April fifth at two o'clock in the afternoon. Right, April fifth. Right. And speaking yeah. of public hearings, uh, there is a public hearing uh, this morning, um, and I think it's one of your bills, Senator Ada, uh, related to the qualifying certificate program. Yeah, so what that does, Bree, it, it just turns around and it allows the mayor's uh, council or the mayor's offices to participate in that uh, in that process. You know, um, the, the bills that I've introduced both yesterday and, and today, uh, both 47 and 48, is... Uh, you know, including including the mayor's uh, councils and uh, uh, municipal planning councils, so that they'll be able to avail whatever funding is available, right? I mean, when you look at what's going on, uh, their funds have been cut as well. So if there's a process that, you know, by the by the QC uh, qualifications uh, uh, program, that if they're able to get into any of those funds that are available, then why not, right? Let them be able to participate in that as well, not just the you know, the, um, the NGOs, right? Um, so, and that's what this bill is about. Mm-hmm. And, and just so Senator Duenas, uh, during re- the recent session, so did you move for an override of your bill, Bill 11? I did not, and thank you for the question. There's two fundamental reasons why I did not. <laughs> First is I don't have the votes. <laughs> and, I, and, and, and I think it's important uh, when you, you know, when you go to do this exercise, 
that you don't just do it to do it. You know, uh, the thing is, is that sometimes you've seen bills before uh, that have been controversial, that have been vetoed, and, and, and it sits in the folder for two, three, four months uh, because that senator is working on the votes, trying to convince the other uh, members who have not uh, been supportive of, you know, because conditions will change. We just had another emergency declaration. I'm still going to read through that executive order. I don't know that I agree with it, Bree. I don't know that I agree with it, Chris. I don't know that what's contained in this new emergency again is something that is 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 so overriding in the community uh, that we need an emergency for it, as opposed to just operating our government properly. I don't know what kind of procurement may be, uh, you know, uh, uh, waived in terms of of, of sole sourcing or. Or, or, or what purchases maybe they're getting a, an airplane shaped table now we got a boat shaped right. table let's go get an airplane shaped table absolutely seaport airport you got a t-rex shaped table what kind of how many shapes you got i'm partial to, i'm partial to the boats because i'm a fisherman so <laughs> but you know but you know the thing uh, is is also we are currently now the resolution passed 14 to 0 um, we are currently now arguing in the Supreme Court yeah. on the issue of emergency powers when it comes to quarantines. Chris and Bree, I don't know about you, but I've gotten so many calls from people that are so sick of being put in quarantine, particularly business people who need to travel. And I, I once I recently talked to a businessman who was using the CDC guidelines as the background. He is fully he's received both doses of the vaccine. And it has elapsed a month, but yet it's still put in quarantine. Now, check this out and talk to Dr. Shea about this. They told him, no, you still need the 72-hour test. Guess what? There's a possibility that he tests positive because of the fact that he's gotten the inoculation. He could he could show up at, uh, you know, uh, as a positive uh, because of that, depending on what test they're using. So here's a guy where the CDC guidelines straight away say, that you do not have to quarantine if you are fully vaccinated when you're traveling to a different destination, yet stuck in jail. Is that you what know, the, the, the guidance says, Senator? Yes. The, you go to the CDC website. It basically says that once you have been, once you've received the vaccine, you're not subject to quarantine. You know, you you may have spreading capability. Uh, you know, I've, I've I've done enough research on it. You may have the ability to spread, but not necessarily because you're infected. You have a very low rate of spread if you've kind of come in contact with another individual. But the fact of the matter is, then why can't that individual quarantine at home? A fully vaccinated person should be able to quarantine at home, because you got the same protocols for public health. I'm a COVID survivor. They call me twice a day. How are you doing this morning, Chris? I'm doing okay. Do you need anything? No. Are your symptoms okay? Yes. I'm, I feel terrible, but I, I can breathe. I'm okay. Twice a day they did that. I did not leave the house for 14 days. I, most of these business people can do business from home. There's no reason why they cannot go home and be quarantined at home. So we're in the courts right now in terms of the way this policy has been interpreted because the courts have been throwing have been ruling unanimously almost or, or in almost all cases for the plaintiffs who have come before the court and said i want out I, i'm on and the so, cdc website right now and mm -hmm. um i believe the guidance you're referencing is because we talked about this it says fully vaccinated people may refrain from quarantine and testing if they do not have symptoms of covid19 after contact with someone who has COVID-19. That's right. And 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 so the, the, there's nothing in there that says you need a negative PCR test 72 hours prior to arrival. So if, there, if the individual, and this is what happened, the individual came home and said, here's my card. Okay, I'm showing you that I have, I, I've, 30 days has elapsed since I've gotten a full vaccine. Okay, I don't have any symptoms. You check me, I don't have a fever. I'm not coughing over anybody. I don't have a problem breathing. I feel fine. Um, let me go home. No, you don't have a 72-hour PCR. Go to jail. So you know, <laughs> it just seems it just seems like the protocol is basically you know we're gonna we're gonna quarantine everybody. And so that's the other thing too is they've been talking about Senator. Stuff. How is Cortec gonna make their 20 million if we don't lock these people up in the hotel? Come on, Gatson. 
Hi, Jay Bobak. That was your statement. So. <laughs> Back tomorrow. Be by my tomorrow. What, what are you guys hearing, though? Um, because this new executive order, the, the extension of the public health emergency to May 1st, same day that we plan on reopening travel because the governor, you know, she said that we are well uh, on our way of achieving this path to half the 50 percent of um, fully vaccinated um, adult population, uh, 62.5 thousand people. Um, are you hearing that this public health emergency will be lifted um, by then? Because, you know, the quarantine will, if you're, if you are, um, Neg you receive the negative PCR test within uh, three days prior to arrival. You don't have to quarantine, not at home, not nothing. So are you guys hearing um, that that might be the pos a possibility? You know, you know what, Bree? If Bill 11 were law right now, we would hear that in two weeks because the governor would have to come down to the legislature and explain any purposes or reasons for the renewal comes May 1. Yeah. So we don't have to wait for the surprise. I don't know why that's the, not default already. Yeah. You know, like if the governor's going to come out the day before the freaking emergency ends, she should also, you know, through her graciousness, tell us the people, forget not even about the Republican senators, tell the people, this is why I'm extending it another 30 days. I know you can go to happy hour, you can do everything, but this is why I'm extending it another 30 days. Is it because yeah, exactly. of the federal funds? We need to be in an emergency? I... Yeah, yeah exactly. we don't know. And, and I don't I know. Think... Like, God, throw us a bone, Gov. <laughs> yeah, I think an uh, explanation would have been great to come out with the with the executive order of extending the emergency declaration. You know, when she comes out and says, and you're right, Chris, you know, she came out and says, you know, uh, we, we're extending it. We we see that the the rate, the, the, um, uh, those who are getting uh, vaccinated, the, you know, we're getting more people vaccinated. So hopefully in the next couple of weeks, we'll be able to end this declaration. If not, then we'll continue it again. But as to why we're staying in this emergency yeah. emergency declaration, I think she should have came out and explained. Yeah, but if you ask, they're going to go bite your head off and they're going to get mad that you even want. Why would you even question this decision? Mm -hmm. yeah, well, we're going to take no, a look around you. Yeah, the, the thing is also is please show us any jurisdiction where the state legislatures have exercised their power and removed the emergencies. Please show us any state or jurisdiction that cannot spend federal funds because of the fact that they ended the public health emergency through the legislature. Michigan governor would be screaming right now because she's lost twice in the Superior Supreme Court. Uh, the, she's gone for appeal and she has lost twice uh, at, 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 in the courts in Michigan. And there is not, I have not heard and read any story that the Michigan governor has had any difficulty spending uh, any of the federal relief that's come into Michigan. You would imagine that thing would be all over the news. See what you did, you pesky legislature. I can't spend money now. Yeah. You don't see that. Yeah, I, I mean, don't know. Uh, yeah. If, if I, don't the case, let's... I feel like, yeah, we do deserve an explanation. I mean, we're not, you know, and the governor gets so sensitive about these things when we would just want to know, like, hey, I think the people deserve to know, like, why are we going another 30 days? And you're right. Maybe it's something as simple as like, oh, because we cannot spend the 600 federal if it's not an emergency. Or, oh, we just need to keep it on an emergency because we're almost at the path to half or something. It's, it says, whereas the emergence of more contagious variants of the virus that causes COVID-19 in several countries. Thank you. Including the U.S. So, yeah, necessitates this, continued yeah, public this, health precautions. So it's the variant that we don't have yeah, that they took care of. So no, but they took care of it. So this is the national debate as well. I mean, you really see a difference uh, between those. <laughs> it's not an emergency out. because they announced that we have the Cali variant, but then they said, oh, no, we're good because of our strict uh, response. But now the yeah. variant's a threat. I well, mean, even if we lifted our, our public health emergency locally, as long as the president still declared the nation under emergency, there's still emergency declaration for the United States, we'd still be receiving federal funds. So, you know. What we do locally is one thing, and I think uh, that's what we need to start addressing is how we move locally. Uh, if we can ensure that, uh, you know, all these things that we put into place, all the, the uh, 
the protocols that are put into place and we can open up our economy come May 1st and let's do it. But let's get rid of the emergency declaration as well, because mm -hmm. obviously we're not in an emergency state if we're yeah. allowing visitors to, to come into our island. Yeah. I mean, I agree there's varying degrees of emergency, right? But I just feel like it's very inconsiderate to not even consider telling the average people out here, this is why we're going another month. And then it's almost like, are they forgetting about this? Because we get the announcement like the day before. Yeah, and, and you're you're actually so right, Bree. I mean, it would be a completely mixed message if we go into May one and 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 the strive for whatever we're striving for, uh, we get there and then we do a public health emergency declaration and say, you know, Myla Hollum, we're open for business. I mean, it, it does. It's it's going to be a it's going to be two you know opposing messages basically. By any chance, did you guys get to meet with um, Congressman St. Nicholas uh, while he was here? Or do you have any idea when he'll be giving his annual um, address? I, ha no. I haven't. I know that uh, if, if, if he does, uh, if we do have a chance to meet, I want to make sure that I get some cookies too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you like them cookies, huh, Senator? I, I probably shouldn't. <laughs> okay, maybe. okay yeah, guys. Maybe Thanks for Again, coming to our TED Talk. Bring me papaya. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, papaya is good for the digestive. Oh, yeah, I, I need it. Well, okay, guys. <laughs> I, I mean, I'm sure you saw on my Instagram, I did a whole thing on this Bill 73 that was it was a little tongue-in-cheek about just the silencers and suppressors and Holy Week and the need to be quiet. And I'm pretty sure, I well, I know I pissed off a lot of gun owners out there, so that's why I kind of wanted to go in and and discuss it out here on the show just to get more info on it. So I appreciate uh, the openness and the transparency because I, I feel like the last people you want to piss off are people who got guns. So I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm, you know, I know some of you guys took it the wrong way. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. It's good, Chris. Yeah. You know, and I'm glad that you, you brought it up. I wish I just had heads up on it, but it, it's good. I'm glad. Thank you. Right on. Good right on. Okay. Stay safe. Good uh, luck uh, today. Thank you, guys. Have okay. a wonderful day. We'll see you guys. All right. Right. There you go. Uh, 824. Yeah, Good morning. Are you really into that, Bill?